My purpose in life uh, was to spread entrepreneurship and venture capital around the world. I just know that that was why I was put on the earth. I think that most governments should abandon their own currency because they are so far behind. Uh, Bitcoin's so much better than most of those currencies, they should just be adapting Bitcoin or maybe some other crypto. Fiat's just not as good. Now maybe fiat will create, maybe some governments will create a currency that can actually compete with Bitcoin, but I doubt it. Uh, they'd have to hire some really good people and get them really working hard on creating a great digital currency and then they'd still be tribal because they sort of say, well, no, we're the government and we have our tribe and our tribe does whatever we tell them to do. Well, now that tribe can move. The tribe can do business anywhere in the world. The tribe can uh, uh, decide that maybe there's a better way to go. Uh, they only have 1.4 million people in Estonia, but they have 100,000 uh, virtual residents. And having that, that's sort of the beginning of governments competing for us. And with that data, you can have something called a smart contract. You can build a deal, a contract, into software. All that data uh, can be combined now and can be extrapolated and all the deep learning can happen. And that can make it so that um, the diagnostics that artificial intelligence provides can be better than what a doctor provides. It's interesting, uh, well, if you, you run the numbers, uh, you know, Andrew Carnegie had 1% of the wealth of the entire world at one point. So clearly the gap is narrowing between the poorest and the richest. At Draper University, we've had uh, about 1,200 students. They've come from 86 different countries. They've, they've gone off to start 350 companies. They've been, those companies have all been outside of here. When we start Draper University, I always um, get everybody standing around the pool and, uh, and I say, okay, well, what do you do when you're gonna start a business? How, how, what do you need to do? And they say, well, you gotta build a product or you gotta find a customer. You gotta say, all those things are very relevant, but what you really need to do is take the first step. And then I take the step and we all go into the pool and they realize that it is kind of a leap of faith. Yes. Uh, and you need that leap of faith if you're gonna do something extraordinary with your life. Boom, what's up everyone? Welcome to Simulation. I'm your host, Alan Sakian. We are on site at the beautiful Hero City in San Mateo, California. We are now gonna be speaking to Tim Draper. Hi, Tim. How are you, Alan? Thanks for coming off for yeah, round number two. Terrific, thank you, my pleasure. <laughs> I'm so pumped for this. For those that missed the first episode with Tim, you can find the link in the bio below. Tim, let's just jump right into things. I'm so fast. <laughs> they saw the first one, they still want to come back for more. <laughs> yeah, there's so much more to unpack. <laughs> Tim, I've been so fascinated with this question. It seems like one of the most first principled questions that young people should be endeavoring into when they get birthed into this world. What are your thoughts on the purpose of this human experience? Well, it's really interesting. I, I think we're all sort of uh, energy sources on this planet flying through the, through the uh, universes. And, uh, and, and we seem very small in relation, but I think we, ha we have a mission and that is to um, you know, explore new worlds. Uh, to think in terms of how to improve the world that we live in, uh, how to help each other kind of adjust to this world and how in its changing environment. Uh, I think it's really, uh, also I think we should all have fun. Mm -hmm. this, is a, this is a wonderful experience we all get to share in. It's not always great, but it's wonderful, it, full of wonder. And, uh, and it, it has uh, a big impact on uh, what we do can have a big impact on future generations, uh, both positive and negative. And the positive ones, um, think of all the uh, incredible things that great entrepreneurs have done and they've overcome uh, extraordinary 
barriers to do so, and most of the barriers are cultural, because culture doesn't like to change very quickly, but the entrepreneurs are trying to take us to a new place. They're trying to change our world. Uh, you know, there were so many awful articles about Steve Jobs, but think of what he's done for all of us. And uh, same thing's happening with a, with a lot of the great entrepreneurs now, where they're getting um, uh, sort of <laughs> victimized. They're being attacked, and I think that what they're really doing is they're they're changing culture, and culture doesn't like moving. And, uh, and they're moving humanity to a new level. Mm. And we're all going to be better off because of them, but uh, a lot of humanity fights them all the way to the end. Cool. So the purpose being mm. that we want to make this world that we've been birthed into better. We want to explore new worlds. Uh, and entrepreneurs typically take on this burden of genius to make the world better and to move society in that direction. And I like that a lot, Tim. What about your purpose? So I, um, my purpose in life uh, was to spread entrepreneurship and venture capital around the world. I just know that that was why I was put on the earth. Uh, and now uh, a lot of the world already has it now. So I feel like my purpose has, has, is, is evolving. And uh, now I, I just want to uh, hyper accelerate it. I, I want to educate people, get them thinking about becoming entrepreneurs, see how uh, creative they can become. Because we have, we have new platforms that will accelerate new changes. So uh, if somebody comes up with a new way of doing something, uh, the word will spread around the planet faster than ever before. And so they can create huge changes in our world faster and better than they ever could before. So uh, this is really, um, it's a very exciting time for me and I, my guess is that it will get more and more exciting uh, as we're able to do more things. Let's, let's see this from the perspective of, you. we're talking about this big human experience that's just so beautiful that we get to experience it. Do you feel like it's divine that we're given this opportunity to endeavor into consciousness and explore our passions and make the world a better place? Do you feel like this is a divine rock orbiting the star that we all get to share? Um, I don't know really if it's a divine rock. I do know that um, there are all sorts of interesting spiritual things happening around us. I know I get moved to do things. And I know that they are not always going to be popular, but, uh, but I get moved to do them anyway. And I'm sure a lot of entrepreneurs feel that way, that they are moved to make some big impact. Yes. And, uh, and actually recently I've been sort of feeling like I got to get this, I got to get the world to understand what uh, the big sociological change is, is uh, happening, what, what this new change is going to be. Uh, and I got an early window on it because uh, I got all excited about Bitcoin very early. Well, it's decentralized. That means that it, it pervades the world without uh, having friction on the borders. Uh, it means that the borders become less relevant. Uh, the borders were set up because we were all um, tribal. Uh, and and all of those tribes were set up to protect the people inside the tribe from the other tribe. Well, now any of us who do any kind of international business or even business across state lines uh, understand that uh, that tribalism is certainly less relevant than it ever was before. And so uh, we uh, so when when we see um, uh, people talking about trade wars or walls or whatever, uh, we sort of say, oh, come on, you're, you're going cross purposes to the rest of, the, of your population. Your population is benefiting from all of the trade, all of the openness that is happening between these countries. And so why are we doing this? Mm -hmm. uh, so I, I look and I say, um, there's even more coming.
<laughs> and that is that uh, a decentralized planet doesn't just mean Bitcoin. It doesn't just mean decentralized uh, currency. It could be uh, decentralized services. Uh, government services can be provided cross-border. Government services are generally just a, an insurance policy. They're, they're set up like an insurance policy. They, um, they provide us uh, health care insurance or workman's comp insurance or pension insurance or whatever. Well, those now with Bitcoin and the blockchain, which is this perfect ledger and smart contracts, can be done completely virtually. They can be done across border. You could, you could have your, your social security provided from Chile and you could have your health care insurance provided from Canada. Um, I'm, a, uh, I'm the third virtual resident of Estonia mm -hmm. and, that, um, and Estonia has already recognized that they, need to, that they can provide services across border. Uh, they only have 1.4 million people in Estonia, but they have 100,000 uh, virtual residents. Mm -hmm. And having that, that's sort of the beginning of governments competing for us. Uh, they are accountable to us. And we can, if we don't like what one government is providing, we could potentially go to another. And the best of governments, or the small governments, the ones who can move quickly, are adapting very quickly to this and they're starting to provide better and better services to attract more and more businesses and money and citizens to their uh, region or at least to their virtual region. And then uh, the bigger uh, the bigger countries are um, having a, a a back wave on this. They are they are having a bad reaction, and I look at some of these things like the trade war, or the wall, or whatever, um, the the tensions that are being created by various state departments. Um, I look at that as a reaction to the fact that a lot of these governments um, have services that are so antiquated they're not needed anymore. And they are trying to justify their existence by creating more tensions. Mm -hmm. And we don't need those tensions. We're so much better off without them. Mm -hmm. And, uh, and I, I liked it 10 years ago. We, were, uh, we, were very, we had a very open border with China. We both benefited in a huge way from that open border. Yeah. Um, now tightening that um, trying to put a line between those two countries, uh, both the leaders are hurting their own populations. Mm -hmm. So <clears throat> this, this beautiful uh, endeavor into consciousness that we have on this planet is now becoming decentralized. The amount of friction in between financial service or the friction between any type of exchange of goods or ideas is just becoming more and more frictionless and that's helping us be more creative, execute more effectively. This also ties us into what you were saying a little bit ago with your role, your divine purpose being in a sense you're kind of this, you're like riding this wave of like fueling, you're like kind of throwing little fuels under people's entrepreneurial booties so that they can go and, and continue endeavoring into their success as optimally as they can. And so that's one thing that I feel like more and more venture capital now being e more easily accessed in Asia, Latin America, Africa is now starting to uh, empower entrepreneurs to achieve what they set out as their divine purpose. So I, I like that a lot now. And I think yeah. you can um, start a business from anywhere and that the world, anybody with a smartphone has access to a search engine and that search engine can provide them with whatever information that they really need. And that brings everybody to sort of the same level in order to start the business that will take society to the next level. And so uh, it is a great flattening of the, um, of the uh, talent of the earth. Everyone around the earth can now see, let's say you're, um, you're into um, uh, biocomputing. Uh, 
Well, you could be, uh, you can catch up with the rest of the world just by kind of going online and figuring out where you should be in biocomputing. And then, <laughs> and then uh, you can figure out where everybody is and then say, well, what's the next step? And start a business and, uh, and get it funded. And boy, can you get things funded easily now. Uh, there, there are funding sources throughout the world that all want uh, more entrepreneurship in their uh, region, and so people anywhere around the world can can start something. This is really an exciting time for that. Yeah, and let's talk about how, uh, as 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 a in a sense, we have more and more of the wealth that's being created around the world. Um, we have the first instances of trillion dollar companies. Um, we have a $100 billion plus net worths for people. Um, and the basic needs, the standard of living across the world is also slowly increasing. Do you overall see that hierarchy having a, a, a gap that's closing or do you see it kind of skyrocketing <clears throat> and the bottom's trying to catch up but do you see it being exacerbated? I, um it's interesting, uh, well, if you, you run the numbers, uh, you know, Andrew Carnegie had 1% of the wealth of the entire world at one point. So clearly the gap is narrowing between the poorest and the richest. And the world's middle class gr is growing at an extraordinary rate. So more and more people are living at, a, at, a, uh, at least a, a, good, a good level. Um, there are still, uh, places in Africa and San Francisco where people are living in squalor and uh, and I think that those kinds of things really need to be changed and and it's interesting um, by putting the band-aids on them uh, we're not helping uh, by just saying hey we need more services for the homeless all that does is attract more people to that place for to be homeless. Uh, what we really need to do is uh, create fewer <laughs> regulations so that businesses can thrive and then they can go build low-cost housing so they can build a better system for, uh, for delivering food. Uh, regulations are really hampering and hurting uh, and, and, and San Francisco has the worst, high, uh, worst regulations, I think, of anywhere on the planet. And they have the most homeless. Uh, so whatever is whatever's happening there is the wrong thing that, ha that should be happening. And the freest places tend to have the, the fewest homeless. Some places, uh, like uh, socialist Russia, um, seem to have fewer homeless. But they had, they in effect created a, an entire population of homeless because people in Russia are, are in effect starving by comparison because it's all top down, it's all uh, government controlled. We do not want the government controlling things. Our government already has half of the, the um, they have half of my money, they have, they have half of the, uh, the economic. Uh, value of the country, I don't think we're getting half the services out of that half. Uh, so I think we really need to shrink our governments. And all, that's true all the way around the world. And the smaller governments are thriving because they're attracting all the businesses. They're, um, they have the wealthier populations because they're attracting all the businesses. Mm -hmm. So some of these smaller countries, Malta, Gibraltar, Switzerland, uh, Singapore, they're starting to get very wealthy populations because they are, uh, well, Singapore didn't used to be free, but it's a very free market economy. And, uh, and they're doing things to attract businesses and they have very few homeless in any of those places. So, uh, so I think this, uh, this uh, the good news is that the rich, poor, um, differential, uh, if you, you can, you can spin the statistics anywhere, the way you want, but generally the world is getting wealthier and people are living better. 
Yeah, and at the same time that there's this opportunity for those that uh, have accumulated quite a bit of wealth to be able to procure whatever sort of aug augmentations to their intelligence or their metabolism that are now slowly starting to evolve more and more. I mean, just the simple way even in the past that you could have kind of like a, someone that was maybe a servant or a maid or an assistant or whatever that would basically do the routine uh, mundane tasks for you so that you could focus on your creative best whereas people maybe in the lower or middle parts of the hierarchy still also have to do the lower, um, more mundane or routine things as well. So there is this I, interesting I, amount of... I actually think that, that um, everybody, everybody has those mundane tasks and everybody does them. Um, well, it's and, pretty obvious. And like it's when true. Bill, Bill Gates went on the Ellen DeGeneres show, right? And he couldn't like name any of the grocery store prices. He had, hadn't been in a grocery store for so long. Yeah. And so when so there are a few people know, that are sort of missing that, but think of what he's provided to the oh, world. Oh yeah, of course. He, I mean, that guy has made stuff. extraordinary things it happen to the world. And um, and there's a there's some argument that says if he had kept his money in Microsoft that we'd be better off than him taking half his money and giving it away. Um, there is a pretty good argument for that. Uh, if, you, yeah, yeah. if you continue to build a business that has that kind of impact on the world, that that kind of, um, of a spread of wealth in, uh, in the world, that that could actually be a bigger deal than taking half of it and giving it away. Yeah, yeah. And also, uh, although yeah. uh, in giving it away, he has done an extraordinary job. Uh, he has Absolutely he's focused very Foundation, much yeah. on the numbers. He's focused yeah. very much on, you know, where are we having the most impact? Where are we doing the best things for humanity? And yeah. uh, and so I really admire that guy for that. Yeah, likewise. So I, it, hey, it's more power clear. to him. Let, pe yeah. let other people do the shopping for him. And, yeah. and well, th think of that, that's other entrepreneurs yeah. are making a fortune uh, delivering him his groceries. You know, I mean, Instacart and sure. DoorDash and you know, <laughs> sure, sure. Uber Eats, yeah, yeah, they're yeah. all delivering yeah. him his yeah. business. And those entrepreneurs are also making a fortune. That's right. And so we're providing those services more and more and more easily. Yeah, the mechanisms uh, at once wealth is accumulated uh, for propagating further reshaping of uh, potentially regulations to propagate market advantage is something that people are very hesitant of. You know, you listed like making the government very uh, 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 decreasing the size of the government. I am. Um, this is something that is very much so uh, a v in very interesting topic to many people. That could it potentially be that having um, uh, a way that maybe people that accumulate lots of wealth can then redistribute that amount of wealth through entrepreneurship and through creative endeavors rather than just giving it away. To um, there's so much cool uh, nuance there. But one thing just seems to remain certain, and it's, it's that when you're when you're a young lion, you love capitalism because you're hungry you're out in the world and when you become an old lion and you've reaped many of the rewards of capitalism it's paramount to not try and go back and reshape the regulations to propagate your own advantage this is a very important right that principle. is that has been a big problem because the people who vote are older and they are pushing for their agenda and the people who we've elected, I mean, look at the average age of the senators in the U.S. My God, they are old. Um, they're older than I am. And, uh, and I'm not so sure they're, they're thinking in terms of, uh, you know, how, how well do we educate our population? How do we encourage free markets? They're thinking about things like, you know, how cheaply they can get their pills and you know what how how they can live to be more than 85 um let's hit, I, let's I think hit a point that's on, a pretty interesting yeah, thing it is, it now, is yeah, the average age and the united states is one of the most diverse countries in the world a melting pot and our representation in terms of diversity is quite low uh in the congress um, but other places in the world are more homogenous. It was interesting just recently coming back from China and just seeing how there is no prop there is no propaganda around diversity in China. It's kind of interesting. We have propaganda around diversity in the United States. You need mm -hmm. to be diverse in this way or that way. Yeah, and why force that? It's already happening. 
I, I always think, you know, I look around, look around here. We, we've had, uh, at Draper University, we've had uh, about 1,200 students. They've come from 86 different countries. They've, they've gone off to start 350 companies. They've been, those companies have all been outside of here. Um, it, they, they go and they spread the good word. They create businesses wherever they came from. Uh, it, and they come from all over. I mean, we have, we have a great relationship with Senegal, with uh, Saudi, with Taiwan, with, um, and, and each of them send some of their top people to come to Draper University to go start businesses. And they have an application and process in these countries that's quite rigorous. It's to very find rigorous to get that, get that cream. student. Right, yeah. we, and we're looking for the best of the best. And what's great is that it comes in all shapes and sizes, and we, um, we love that. I mean, our, um, we had a great moment at Draper University. There, um, we had uh, 12 people from Saudi in the spring, uh, and, and I was about to do the graduation speech, and I said, hey, a bunch of people are missing. And one of the Saudi women said, oh, they're out praying. And I said, get them in here. And I, I said, come on, bring them all in here, we'll all pray. And so then we all did the, the Saudi prayer, and you know, it was great fun. We got everybody doing it, going down on their knees and up and down. And uh, they chanted and whatever uh, to Allah. And then I said, anybody else have a prayer they want to do? And uh, the Israeli woman puts her hand up and said, I'll do a Jewish prayer. She does a Jewish prayer. We all do the Jewish prayer. And then, uh, then three, three Hindus get up and they say, well, we'll do a Hindu prayer and kind of a Hindu chant. Uh -huh. And we all did the Hindu chant. And then two Catholics got up and did some, you know, moment of silence for, uh, and, and I thought, what? you know, <laughs> yeah, yeah. look, we're, we're all, we've all got the same deal here. Yeah. Uh, it's one big world. And, uh, and first I thought only at Draper University. <laughs> and then I thought, no, this is going to happen everywhere. Yeah. The geographic borders are falling. The governments are, are trying to sort of isolate us and segment us and make us feel like we're not diverse enough or whatever. That's nonsense. We are all going to be completely mixed up and completely diverse. And getting rid of our tribalism and opening up and becoming global is going to be step one. And, and then it's just going to be one big open world and I think uh, Governments will be more like businesses. They're going to have to compete. They're going to have to be accountable to their constituents, their customers, and they uh, and it's uh, it's high time they did, because uh, government really hasn't had anybody um, you know challenging them, because they sort of say, well, no, we're the government and we have our tribe and our tribe does whatever we tell them to do. Well, now that tribe can move. The tribe can do business anywhere in the world. The tribe can uh, uh, decide that maybe there's a better way to go. And in that case, they've got to start thinking, well, wait, how do I attract people from the other tribes? You know, how do I grow my, my government against all these other governments that are attracting my people? Uh, so I think this is the beginning of something really extraordinary. And, uh, yeah, you heard it first here at Draper University. The global decentralization movement, and it was so cool hearing about how people are able to share their different diverse prayers. I and, love stories and, like that. And when you hear the press going off about like, you know, oh, we have to have more of a certain type of people in this certain thing, all you're doing, all the press is doing is showing their own prejudice. They're showing that they have a problem and they're trying to overcome that problem. But, uh, you know, the rest of us all know that, I mean, the people who work for me are of all shapes and sizes. The people who come to Draper University, all shapes and sizes. We've never even thought about it, but we just get the best of the best and they come from wherever they come from.
Mm -hmm. It's been so cool actually making friends with people from Saudi over the summer. It's been a lot of fun having that opportunity while I've been coming through. That's uh, opportunities that you really have to seize because then your, uh, your xenophobia or bigotries just collapse immediately because you realize that you both have very similar principles around love and family and compassion, entrepreneurship, making the world a better place. Okay, let's break down this ideal blockchain infrastructure for the decentralized protocols around the world because I think we now have so many of these, you know, you've been listing now, okay, well, governments, we want them smaller with less regulations, but also, well... Oh, although some people may want bigger governments, but what's great is that we'll get they, to can, pick. Yeah. they can pick. We'll get to pick. Right. And so then another, you know, another then question would be, okay, well, if we had this ideal small government, but this government wants to have some sort of a decentralized currency, but then also we have the private, uh, the private decentralized currencies like Bitcoin, Ethereum, then we also have um, these new giants that are coming up around the world, the, the Amazons and the Facebooks and the, and the Tencents and the Baidus, they're all trying to come up with their own sort of, uh, of also decentralized currencies. So that's only one aspect of it. So I'm just curious that aspect, but then let's also talk about the <coughs> like the decentralized medical aspect, people are really interested in being able to have a constant stream of my biometrics being run up to the cloud and being constantly processed and predicting pathology so I can live longer, mm -hmm. things like that. So let's yeah. go, first we'll go into the, the currencies of the world. Um, I think that most governments should abandon their own currency because they are so far behind. Uh, Bitcoin's so much better than most of those currencies, they should just be adapting Bitcoin or maybe some other crypto. Um, it's, it's much more efficient. Uh, governments with their own currency tend, uh, and, and if the currency is not really providing that good a service, um, they tend to be more corrupt and that leads to more corruption. Um, there are, there are uh, countries around the world whose currencies drop 30% a year uh, just against, the, against a base of, of global currencies. And if that's the case, give it up. You know, you'll get rid of, you'll get rid of corruption, you'll get rid of, uh, you'll, you'll attract all the entrepreneurs to your country, um, and you're, you'll just be better off. Everyone in your country will be better off, except perhaps the person who is corrupt at the top making those decisions. Um, so I think uh, that there is now a competitive system for currencies. Uh, you have Bitcoin and then you have all the Bitcoin knockoffs and then you have currencies like Libra and then you have the stable coins and you have a whole variety of different currencies we now can choose from. And we're going to be all better off because those currencies will be more frictionless, keep better records, be transparent, they'll be a cross-border, uh, they, they're open, uh, they, uh, they can be used for things that the fiat currencies can't be used for, micropayments for instance, or uh, or um, uh, payment across border without having to, you know, give Western Union 16% of your money. Uh, they're, they're, uh, fiat's just not as good. Now maybe fiat will create, maybe some governments will create a currency that can actually compete with Bitcoin, but I doubt it. Uh, they'd have to hire some really good people and get them really working hard on creating a great digital currency. And then they'd still be tribal. Uh, I know that uh, Iceland, I think, created their own currency. I think it was called the Aurora coin. And they said, OK, you can only spend it in Iceland. It defeats the entire yeah, purpose. Yeah. And so, uh, so sometimes you're just going to have to, uh, you know, I mean, governments will have to let some things go in order to compete for the next century. And so this is a really, that's pretty interesting. It's, it may be an interesting time. Now you talked about healthcare. Yeah. I think healthcare is gonna change a lot too. And uh, 
And let me break it down. Bitcoin is this uh, currency that can be used anywhere. Uh, it's kept, everything's kept perfect track of on the blockchain, and, uh, and so that keeps track of currency. But it also keeps track of data, um, keeps perfect track of data. And with that data, you can have something called a smart contract. You can build a deal, a contract, into software. And that means that when an event happens, the payment happens, or the, the, event, the event triggers money moving from one place to another, or data moving from one place to another. Well, um, now you combine that with artificial intelligence. Artificial intelligence is um, really uh, what very clever um, computer experts have done, is they've put probabilistic uh, assessment into data and and they call that um, deep learning and what they can do is they can they can go out there and say hey what kind of relationships do different things have well um, the first of these was with 7-eleven they they found out that beer and diapers were always were often sold together something you never really think but now you can come to your own conclusions as to why beer is always bought when somebody buys diapers. Mm -hmm. But they decide they'd put the beer next to the diapers after that and they sold a lot more of both. Uh, okay, take that technology to healthcare. Let's say you've got all your medical records up into the cloud and I've got all my medical records up into the cloud and so do all the rest of the people in the world. And, uh, and it's not just our medical records, it's our blood test results and our genetic history yeah. and our Fitbit results and what we ate for breakfast and what airplane seat we were sitting in, what hotel we stayed at, who we met, what conference we visited, um, where we go and sit at work, where the air conditioner is, all that data uh, can be combined now and can be extrapolated and all the deep learning can happen and that can make it so that um, the diagnostics that artificial intelligence provides can be better than what a doctor provides. We have a company called Cloud Medics and they actually provide, um, they, they do this and they only with the, only with the doctor data, they um, took the doctor test, which is like patient comes into the office, has a knee problem and a headache, what, what do you do? Um, they, uh, the average doctor gets about a 75. Well, they got an 85, and when combined with a doctor, got a 91 on the test. Uh, which means to me that you kind of would rather have data um, doing your diagnosis at least before the doctor comes and does additional analysis for you. Uh, the way that's that gonna is, change. The way that this all ends up being though very securely, privately decentralized, no silos. This is an ongoing conversation about how all this data ends up being funneled up there. And You know, the press brings it all out. It all, everybody's outed eventually. Um, so holding on to your data is gonna only be a temporary thing in the future, I think, anyway. Yes. But let's say people are really concerned about privacy. They can anonymize the data that goes up there and then anonymize it, bringing it back to you. So you anonymize it, that's who you are. It gets compared with all the other anonymized data up there and then it comes back to you in an anonymous way and says, here is your diagnosis. So this that- is where the quantum encryption world really picks up steam as we continue the quantum computing revolution, the second one that's happening right sure, now. Sure, I think, actually just, I just look at quantum computing as just the next level of computing. It's just going to be faster, better, cheaper, all the, all the great things in it. And, and the things it will allow people to do, none of us can imagine. I think there are going to be things that those quantum computers do that um, none of us can guess what they are, but they're going to be great. Cricket's trying to imagine the big game. Right. <laughs> so, uh, 
So that's part of healthcare. Part of healthcare, the diagnostics part of healthcare is going to change in a big way. Therapeutics of healthcare is going to change also because in therapeutics, data is now becoming really interesting and relevant. Um, people can, can do all these experiments in wet labs, which, you, which used to take years and years and years, and now they can, they can put a camera over the top of it and determine what's happening to each of those little vials in a wet lab. Um, you can even run but, the simulations but that's, of, of yeah, it. But in, that's even the, yeah, that's the just the first part. And figure we have, out yeah, we have, a, we have their companies called Atomwise and Verge Genomics that can run, um, put a disease up on the screen and run um, all the drugs that are off patent against it. Yeah. And then they can find out that, you know, something for Parkinson's might be good for the Ebola, Ebola virus or something for Alzheimer's might be good for ALS. Um, and they'll just run all these things against the disease and then they'll see one that hooks and then they go, oh, oh wow, we can do that. And this is a drug that's already been tested by the FDA. I actually think that those companies eventually are going to do a better job of predicting safety and efficacy than the FDA ever could. And so the FDA will use them as ways of determining whether a drug is going to be um, efficacious efficacious or safe. Yeah, yeah. Do you, um, this is and eventually, this is big... it might be that that becomes the FDA. It becomes artificial yeah. intelligence FDA where they say, well, no, this drug isn't working because we've run the simulation exactly. and it's no good. I mean, eventually you yeah. got to put it into animals and humans. Uh, this is where these things gets out there. combine the quantum computing technology, the super intelligence, the simulations for the healthcare. I'm hopefully with a great deal of, of ethical and moral and uh, philosophical intent behind the advances of Alibaba, Tencent, the Chinese government, Facebook, Amazon, the US government, Google, Apple, etc. That if you can plop these little ethicists and philosophers into the engineering teams that are building the super intelligences, that at least then there's a pure Period of reflection for the engineers and the designers and the ops people of like, okay, well, maybe there's a way to actually work with the team at Amazon to, de to, to decrease the silos of these data points so that we can actually learn more and predict more about your optimal life outcomes. So there's a bunch of really interesting things that are at play on, on, that, on that big picture. And overall, like, the future of how that information goes up on a distributed ledger I think is fascinating and who ends up being uh, uh, in uh, uh, ways of monetizing my own data potentially uh, and deciding when to open up these valves to let data flow do I own it who owns it but just that whole e that whole technology stack is going to be really fascinating moving forward in the future. I think uh, people are going to own their own data and they'll provide it anonymously maybe for free because they want society to benefit from it. But, uh, but if they want it to go out to somebody who's going to advertise to them, they should, they, they can probably figure out how to be paid. Uh, we have data a long way to go between that. those two things, though, Tim. Right now, it's <clears throat> we don't own any of our data, and you're saying we're all going to own all of our data, and that gap is something that a lot of people are wondering how is going to be closed. Well, you know, it's it's not going to be closed by regulation. It's going to be closed by entrepreneurs like Data Wallet coming up and saying, "Hey, take back your own data, join us, take back your own data, and." and join our service and our service will allow you to then take that data and, and sell it out to whoever you want to sell it out to. I, I tend to feel like giving out the data is a, a real benefit to me because I end up, um, I don't drink and so Likewise. I sit there and I watch football games and I'm sitting here watching three quarters of them are beer ads and I'm thinking, you know, yeah. you guys could do a lot better than For selling you. me a beer. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> For us. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, and, uh, and so that can be very targeted. And I would much rather see something that's relevant to me. Um, yeah. The beer ad's not relevant to me. Yeah, yeah. 
Um, let's talk. Uh, let, let's talk on um, the the future of uh, just in general humans and what we're going to be doing if we're talking about super intelligences, we're talking about quantum computing, we're talking about these designer virtual worlds that people can immerse themselves in and, and design them and play in them. What is the role of the human when super intelligence can just run all of the creative computations much faster than we can and just create things with nanotechnologies? Just what is the future of what we do? Yeah, it was fun. My son said, said AI is going to take all of our jobs. So what do we do then? And what's great about it is it's like, you know, if, if everybody was a farmer, which they were way back when, and the hoe came out, or the tractor, all of a sudden, you know, now it's like 3% of the world is a farmer. Um, the other ones all had to figure out what else to do. Well, we're very creative, we humans, and we will come up with all sorts of new things to do. And I can't imagine how exciting it'll be when, when let's say, only 3% of us are doing the things that, are, that we're doing today and the other 97% are doing entrepreneurial things that uh, could have a big impact on the rest of us. So I, I'm very excited by that. I mean, if you can get a machine to do something for you during the day, do it because then you can have, you can go out and you can create more, you can do more, you can have more leisure time, you can have more, um, more time for thought you can figure out new ways for those machines to help us. Uh, so I believe that humanity moves up. Uh, there are these, um, there are temporary tragedies, and those are people who, you know, hey, I spent my whole life being a, a buggy whip manufacturer. I'm the best buggy whip manufacturer in the world, and then they come up with this automobile. You know, what do I do? I've got to reinvent myself and I'm 55 or whatever. That kind of thing, that will be, there will be those tragedies because AI, when, when people use AI to do venture capital, I'm gonna to have to go figure out something else to do. But I'm kind of excited about that opportunity. Uh, you know, so that, so that the mundane part of venture capital is done by AI and then uh, I can filter it down and I focus just on the ones that matter. Yeah. Um, you know, the self-driving car. Uber has been fantastic for this uh, gig economy and getting people off the street and making sure everybody's working, and that is really exciting. It's fan been fantastic. Well, all those people, um, if there are self-driving cars, are gonna have to find something else for the gig economy, but, uh, and they, see, the regulations are trying to kill the gig economy, which is just ridiculous. They're trying to make it so that everybody has to be an employee of Uber. You go out and you drive once a week or twice a week, somehow you're now, Uber is now responsible to you forever. I mean, that, it just makes completely no sense. And I think that's driven by very powerful public employee unions who are saying, you must, be, you must all be the same. I believe people are, uh, the beauty of the world is that people are different and they come up with different things. I don't think the beauty of the world is that we all are automatons and are all doing exactly what the public employee unions are telling us what to do. Of course. And next time we... By the way, I yeah. like private unions. I think that, that battle should always rage on between the private employee and the mm. management. Mm -hmm. But yeah, yeah. public employee unions, Wait, why is our government unionized and growing? I mean, it's like they've, they've just decided that they're all gonna live better lives than the rest of us. It's, it's getting to be more of a, a you know, the, the, the old dictatorships and uh, strong socialist governments. We don't need that. We are way better off if we go out and we create our own world, um, make it great, and, uh, and have, uh, let the thousand flowers grow. Yeah, everyone's own unique creative potential being maximized. I, next time we talk, we'll get the full uh, the dive also into your passion about trying to restructure, even break apart like this full state of California and figure out how to separate it up and figure out how to optimally run a governance. I'll ask you some more questions well, it's a about consistent, that. It's consistent with me because I'm saying 
Governments have to now compete. They have to be yes. accountable to their yes. people. This is what you've been and mentioning. And so I'm saying, yes, yes. saying, hey, California has this weird uh, monopoly because they have the whole coastline that, that's relevant. I mean, the, Oregon and Washington have a coastline, but people aren't hanging out at the beach there. Um, so they have this beautiful part of a state that they control and, uh, and they really need something to break that up and make it, uh, make it more competitive. And we'll talk about maybe some of those dynamics and also some of your other <coughs> governance principles maybe as we um, do more rounds together on the show. To many people are wondering what would be maybe one of the most profound things that you've learned in your adventure of consciousness? Um, here's what I've learned. Taking that step, trying, uh, is the most exciting part of life. And uh, I think everyone benefits from the idea of trying stuff. And so whenever you're in a quandary, whether you think this is a safe thing to do or, a, or uh, something that other people will think is a bad idea, do it anyway. Um, I think we're, we're so tied up in safety that, we, that we're like bubble boy. We're uh, over, over protecting ourselves in, uh, and I think we need to take um, more chances and, and try new things. And, and that's the beauty of life. Life is so much more fun when you try something new. The world opens up to you. You try it and you go, oh, ooh, that didn't work. We'll have to try something else. Um, so I, I believe that, that um, that's one of the keys to life, to a, to a happy life, is to keep trying new things, keep trying to do um, something that, and also to have some sort of a mission in your life. Even if it's gonna change, um, go have a mission. It's It's a, it's, it's fun because then you, you know that you, um, you will take those chances toward a purpose. Of and if you have that purpose, it, 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 it in effect justifies it to yourself that you can go ahead and try these things. Yeah. So um, take that leap. I would say take those. Yeah. I, you know, when we, when we start Draper University, I always um, get everybody standing around the pool and uh, and I say, okay, well, what do you do when you're going to start a business? How, how, what do you need to do? And they say, well, you got to build a product or you got to find a customer. You got to say all those things are very relevant, but what you really need to do is take the first step. And then I take the step and we all go into the pool and they realize that it is kind of a leap of faith. Yes. Uh, and you need that leap of faith if you're going to do something extraordinary with your life. I love it too. I love it so much. <laughs> Thank you. Great. My Thank pleasure. You. Thank you. Good. Thank yeah. You. Such a good ending. Such a good piece of wisdom for us at the very end. Take that leap of faith, everyone, into your mission, into building the future, everyone. Thank you so much for tuning in. We greatly appreciate it. Do check out all of the cool links in the bio below to Tim's work. Check it out and support them. Join them in the endeavors. Have more conversations with your friends, families, coworkers, people online about all these topics that we talked about today on the episode. And also support us. Help us continue doing cool things like coming on site to Hero City for these interviews. You can find all of our links in the bio below. And go and build the future. Everyone manifest your dreams into the world. We love you very much. Thank you for tuning in, and we'll see you soon. Peace.